So we all know the iconic Josie and the Pussycats. Y'all know them, the long tails and two ears for hats. You know them, the ones who got bogusly sidelined on Riverdale. Roberto, I'm still not over that. We gotta have a discussion, sir. Let me tell you the origin of how they sold their souls for fame. Afterlife with Archie, number 10. So, it's present day. We in Los Angeles, right? Josie is sitting down, because, you know, she's an international pop star. She's a teen queen. They went from a garage band to, honey, they're playing at the Super Bowl. Now, she's doing a tell-all interview where she's just going to get her life story off of her chest. And this TMZ uh, paparazzi guy, he ain't going to know what hit. So, you know, he's thirsty for the tea like the rest of us. So, we're listening. And he's like, okay, so we begin. And she's like, well, according to my birth certificate, I was born in 1906. Ma'am, we're in the 2000s, 1906. Honey, you'd be overnight. He's like, girl, you are a teen idol. You are 17 or 18. Do I look like boo-boo the fool to you? Question of the day. And the reporter wants to know, because like he's saying, honey, y'all outsell Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, and Adele. So, huh? Mm. So it's like, what is your secret if you were born in 1906, miss? He said, I want transparency. And Josie's like, honey, you shall receive it in abundance. Sound like it's time for a flashback. 1906, here we come. And a woman named Josephine is poor, she's husbandless, and she's about to give birth. She crashes in an alley and gives birth to her child. And not six minutes after the girl took her first breath, her mother died. And the woman who found Josephine lifeless body in an alleyway took the baby and named her Josie and left her on the doorstep of an orphanage. Now this hoe, she is a walking crab apple. She is Mrs. Cabot and she is the she's the one who runs the orphanage, but she's very much like an evil stepmother. She gives you very much Lady Tremaine tease. And she takes Josie in and of course her and Josie have kind of like a Cinderella Lady Tremaine relationship. And at the orphanage, this is where Josie finally meets her future bandmates, Melody Valentine, uh, Valerie Brown, and Pepper Smith. And then they all discover, as they do their chores every day, that they have a talent for singing, because that's what they do while that evil-ass witch make them do their chores. Now, there ain't nothing wrong with chores. Kids need chores. But however, there's a limit to everything. There's a fine line between uh, chores and maid service. Hello, somebody. However, once again, Miss Cabot, she's trying to beat their talent out of them. Until one night, Mrs. Cabot, a creepy-ass man, overhears the girl singing, and he's like, I can do something with that. And his name is Uncle Buddy. I don't ever trust nobody called Buddy. Part 2 of Josie and the Pussycats and How Do You Tell So They Sold for Fame. So Miss Cabot, who runs the orphanage that Josie and the other Pussycats stay at, uh, her weird-ass man, pretty much her pimp, uh, Uncle Buddy, never trust a nigga named that's Buddy. Because Buddy what? Anyway, so he goes all Joe Jackson and he sees a talent in these girls. So he buys them costumes and stuff like that. Because you know those sleazy manager types, they can spot out some talent, but they can't spot out some honesty. Hello, somebody. And he promises them fame and fortune. So now it's time for them to get on the road and make some money. And he calls the girls the Cabot Sisters. And they go on the vaudeville circuit. So, you know, this is like around the 20s and stuff like that. And vaudeville, ooh, those are some hard days. And they stop at this little town called Riverdale. And, you know, this is the era where those sisterhood groups were really popular. They performed for the war heroes and the USOs. Honey, hit them hoes with the beast skating boogie and they ate that shit up. And they're getting the money. Well, Uncle Buddy is getting the money. Because you know those sleazy manager type. And the girls are just living their life. So when they get to the next town in Georgia, they are in for a rude awakening. Because guess what? This is still the 20s. And they have a black band member. And a brick comes flying through their window with a message on it. And on a brick, it reads, um, go back to the jungle. And then uh, Valerie's like, is it about me? Sis. And this is what I like about these comments, because yeah, they're light, they're campy, they're very dark in tone, but they also show some realism too, which is appreciated because it helps balance out the supernatural. And they look out the window. And I'm not going to show them because they don't deserve no motherfucking light, but I think you can see by the burning cross and what's peeking out behind my head, uh, what these girls saw. And the club vendor's like, honey, the best bet is for y'all to get out of here. It is not safe. But this Uncle Buddy ethnic, he's like, uh, are we still going to get paid? So this shows you he really doesn't care about the girl's safety, well-being, or the climate and the times that they're in. He's after the money. He doesn't care about the group, really. And they know that. But the girls leave because at the end of the day, they ain't no fool. And they make a pet. We are in this together together forever and they arrive in new york city to perform in a club on broadway the uncle buddy sets all the girls down and tells them some news 
And Miss Cabot, she's pissed off because uh, she's like, honey, you my man. She tells them Pepper, the fourth member of the Pussycat or the Cabot sisters, has to leave because they're going to get married. What if somebody as old as you marrying a teenager? And the girls are like, Pepper, is this what you want? And she's like, yes, Uncle Buddy, I love him. Like, they don't got no choice. She's pregnant. And the girls are like, shocked, because Uncle Buddy, ill. And she's just mad because she got your man. That night, those girls go on the stage for the last time, knowing this is the last time they will ever be a quartet. And they rock the house. And they dedicate it to Pepper since she's leaving the group. And now that Pepper's gone, Miss Cabot brings a new man to meet the girls. So Mrs. Cabot, their legal guardian, uh, brings a guy backstage because after seeing them perform, he's like, I need to meet these girls. And you see his eyes is glowing. I'll be like, boy, what's wrong with you? Now this rich millionaire, he introduces himself as Henry Irving and here's a little history check. He was actually a real person and I think he was one of the inspirations for Dracula. Mm. But he's like a millionaire and he's like here to woo the girls and he's like, I love you guys. You guys are so talented. Come back to my mansion. He's very much like giving you Jay Gatsby, the great Gatsby tea. However, as the girls are talking to him, they're so much caught up in the riches and his good look and how he's so mesmerizing and hypnotizing because that's what vampires do. Um, They don't even see that he doesn't even have a reflection. Look at it. He's holding them flowers down there, but you don't see nothing. And that's what happens when you get mesmerized by the money. But let me stop acting like I wouldn't be one of them hoes. So the girls go back to the mansion for the night, and they leave Pepper behind their old manager and Mrs. Cabot. And they're like, we'll meet you in the morning. And like I said, this is straight out of The Great Gatsby. Like, that's the Valley of Ash and stuff like that. Ugh. And in the words of the great Gatsby, the only thing respectable about him is his money. And remember, these girls are orphans who are just singing on the road. So to be around the rich and famous, it's like another world. They feel like they stepped up a lot. And they perform at the party, and of course, they're a big hit. And while Josie's by herself putting on her lipstick, Henry's butler comes and gets her and is like, hey, he wants you to meet him on a balcony. And so she does by herself. And as they're talking, she realized she is literally hypnotized, frozen, like in lust, but then intrigue and mystery and in fear all wrapped up in one. And he's like, come closer. And he's showing her the stars and explaining them to her because he's like, the stars are forever. And that's what I see in you. You're a star that's going to be around forever. And he's like, I have the eyes for stars. And he's like, tell me, Josephine, do you want to live forever? And she's like, I do. To be a star forever? Hell yeah. But remember, he hypnotized her. And he's like, then close your eyes and you will be born anew. And I'm not showing that part just in case TikTok takes me down. But I think y'all know what vampires do to the net. And now the girls are looking for Josie around the mansion and they find her covered in blood. And they're like, girl, what happened? Were you attacked? And she's like, no, I just need a bath, girl. And she knows what happened, but she can't believe it. So she doesn't even look in the mirror to see that her reflection disappeared. And she knows something's off because she's starting to hear sounds and smell things that are miles away from her. And when she put her hand in the sunlight, it didn't catch on fire. She just felt tingled. And as the girls are leaving, they realize Henry is long gone. Not wanting to hide the secret, she asks the girl, do you want to live forever? Josie does not want to uh, hold this burden all on her own. So she's like, why not share it with the sisters I grew up with? And she takes them into a dark room and they're like, Josie, what are you doing? And they're screaming. They're like, Josie, no, please stop. But it is too late. And they wait to leave until nightfall. And now the girls are all born anew to fly in the night sky. Now, remember, this is all being told from Josie's point of view, because in the present day, she's telling us the story from being interviewed by a news reporter. And he's like, so I'm supposed to believe that y'all went back to New York and just continued living y'all. Josie's like, oh, no, honey, our lives in the daytime were forever over. Like, as far as the world knew, the four Cabot sisters had played their last show that night. Their plan was to go underground and each decade they would reemerge as a new group each time. And kind of reinvent themselves. But remember earlier in the series how they were chased out of that town in Georgia because the Valerie was black? Well, now that they're vampires, they got to make a little pit stop and pick up their friend called Revenge. And they get revenge on every single one. And I hope it was painful. So now as the world goes on and gets into the war, they go uh, they go from the Cabot sisters and they reinvent themselves as the G.I. dolls because now it's a new decade and they're all on their be skeet and boogie ass shit. And they also used to help the allies in other ways too. But then as they enter like stuff like the 50s, as you see, they go from the, the Cabot sisters to the G.I. dolls. Now there's something a little bit more wholesome for the 50s. Then when the 60s hit, Valerie takes the lead and they become the Velvets. And it's easier for them to reinvent themselves and camouflage because there's no internet at this time. 
in her interviewer in present day is like, I kind of remember the Velvets. My parents used to listen to them. And she's like, of course you kind of remember them because that's our power. We can make the world slowly forget. Like without the internet, it was so easy not to leave a paper trail. But speaking of the 60s triggers a old memory she had. She's like, the 60s were such a wonderful sign. Woodstock, the moon landing, until the day the 60s died. Now remember, it's the 60s and they're the Velvets now with Valerie in the lead and they're popular. So they're in the Hollywood Hills going to a party. And it just so happens to be a party at a woman named Roman and Sharon's house. Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski. Yes, that infamous day. And he's like, as in Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate, he's like, yeah, when we got there, we saw everything. And he's like, those are the Charles Manson. And Josie said, no, that's who was blamed for him. But it was really Henry Irving. He just reinvented himself and he changed his identity as he moved through the world like they did. So now that we know that Henry Irving is behind the Manson family murders, Josie knows he's still out there. And she kind of fears him the older she's gotten in this vampire life. And she's like, I am not looking forward to the day that me and that hoe got a cross pass again. So as we move into a new decade, the 70s, you know, they become the queens of the disco. You know? And then as they reemerge in the 80s, it was more difficult because, you know, vampires, the contaminated blood, the AIDS crisis. So, you know, they lost a lot of friends. And one night after she's done playing Studio 54, she goes out the back to meet Valerie and Melody. And guess who she runs into? She's like, help an old friend out. Bitch, this is Pepper. And Josie's like, Pepper? Ooh, Lord, the, the time has not been nice to you. She didn't say that but she's thinking it because I'm reading between the lines because that's where the real tea is. Pepper's like, all these years, I thought you guys disappeared. Something tragic happened to you guys. And she was like, as I would see new groups that look like you, I knew it was you because deep down, when you have a sisterhood, you know. If you know, you know. And the fact that they left her back there with um, that creepy-ass manager, Uncle Buddy, uh, that wicked-ass orphan mother, and she was pregnant as a teen by that predator, it's like, that was so fucked up. They, it's like, they got their vampire, they got zooted up, and they was out. And the fact that they never look back, they can get revenge on everybody else, especially like that racist town. But then you leave Pepper, a teen pregnant girl behind. How does that add up? If I would have wrote it, I would have made it where they gave Pepper the gift of becoming a vampire and her baby would have ended up becoming some type of monster that they have to hunt down. But that's just me. But Josie's pretty much telling her like, I can't make you into what we are because pretty much you'll be living out your last days in a perpetual misery. And she's like, we were supposed to be together forever. You fucking promised me, bitch. And she's like, a Pepper, I'm sorry, but I cannot change you. And Pepper was like, fuck it then. I'm at the end of my life. I don't got nothing to lose. I'll tell everybody about you because I've kept tab. And in the present day, the interviewers are like, okay, well, what happened to Pepper now? So Josie's just like, honey, Pepper vanished. Honey, goodbye. And the thing I'm wondering now is, whatever happened to Pepper's kids? Because they never address it again. And as Josie moves on, she's like, the 90s, honey, the 90s was a hideous time. We moved to London and we became a band called uh, Sugar and Spice Girls. Girl, tell me what you want. But to me, it looked like they were going all a werewolves in London. And then we get to the early 2000s. So now we are in the 2000s and Josie and the Pussycats are going by um, Twilight Child. Get it because it's the early 2000s and y'all know the craze Twilight had on us. So Valerie is in the lead again and they are just ruling out the early 2000s. And Josie's like, I love that version of us when we were Twilight Child because the 2000s, what a time to be alive, honey. She's like, we were hot bitches, bad to the bone, girl. Mm, your lingo was still from the 70s but okay girl and she's like but everything has to come to an end she says except for us bitch because as you know from the story we never end and then as she sees the time she's like oh we gotta get to going and the interview was like to wrap things up uh so now your incarnation is josie and the pussycat y'all posted your videos on youtube for about six years and you were playing out of pop's chocolate shop in riverdale and y'all blew up and now you guys are international phenomenons she said such a meteoric rise, you know, for a band that was playing music in the back of a, a chocolate shop. She's like, now we're playing the Super Bowl. She was like, that's why now after this interview, our next stop is Riverdale. Like, we're probably going to play the old theater that we went when we were the Cabot sisters so many years ago. He's like, well, why did you choose to tell me? And she's like, for the human reason, a little bit of selfishness, a little bit of narcissism, you know, like a kitty cocktail, the best of both worlds. And you know what they say, confessions are good for the soul, but ho, you a vampire, so you don't got one. So 
what's what's going on she's like at any rate it's good to unburden myself and this is where the interviewer starts to feel unsettled because he's like if you're telling me your secrets what's the point point?" and that's when josie hits i'm like it's okay because it's not like you'll be telling anybody and she starts hypnotizing him telling him it's okay because guess what even though i told you all this and we sat down and you thought we were friends honey you never even showed up here He's like, you never went up to my suite and you never met my sisters. You bash them in the media and you think we're not humans. So, honey, that animal blood and that synthetic blood we've been using over the years, honey, every now and again, we need the real thing. And she leads him upstairs. And she's like, ladies, dinner time. Then the other girl's like, yay. And then uh, Valerie's like, yes, queen. Later that night, as they're on their private jet to Riverdale. Okay, pussycats, private jet. And Val's like, what's wrong, Josie? And Josie's just like, just thinking a simpler day. Aren't we all? And the flight attendant comes to tell them there is some trouble happening in Riverdale. And they're like, Riverdale on fire? Josie's like, dinner time. Little do they know, there's a zombie apocalypse happening down in Riverdale right now. But as Josie tells them, they're stars. And stars are forever, especially when you're a vampire.